On February 4th, 2010, the McStay family of four vanished. When they were reported missing 11 days later, a carton of eggs and bowls of popcorn were still on the counters in their home in Fallbrook, California, a beautiful little town unofficially known as the Friendly Village. Police were baffled. There were no signs of struggle in the house. The family's two dogs were still in the backyard, but Joseph McStay, his wife Summer, and their two little boys, three-year-old Joey Jr. and four-year-old Gianni, were simply gone. In the first recap, I'm going to tell you what happened in the McStay family house that day. But don't go anywhere because in recap number two, I'm going to tell you about another family tragedy that still has investigators puzzled almost a hundred years later. Huh. This is the story of the brutal murders of all six members of the Gruber household in Hinterkaifeck, Germany in March 1922. Now, their killer has never been caught, but theories about who did it range from a mystery man secretly living in their attic to a son-in-law everyone thought was dead. Huh. Hey, everybody. I'm her husband, Chris. <laughs> I'm Amy, and this is True Crime Recaps. Every week, we're here bringing you twice the crime in half the time. Before we jump into the stories, we just want to take a second to say thank you for spending part of your day with us. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll do us the huge favor of clicking like and subscribe so we can make this a weekly thing. And remember, you can also listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just click the link in the pinned comment below. Thanks again. It means a lot to us to have you here. Now let's jump into the recaps. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Now, I'm a do-it-yourself kind of person, but when it comes to my mental health, I let the experts at BetterHelp take over. Their counselors are licensed, trained, and accredited psychologists, marriage and family therapists, clinical social workers, or licensed professional counselors. Anything you share is confidential. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at BetterHelp.com slash recaps. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash recaps. Now, on with the story. The Southern California family of four looked picture perfect. Joseph McStay managed a successful company manufacturing water features. Summer McStay sold real estate. Together, they had two beautiful little boys, three-year-old Joey Jr. and four-year-old Gianni. Less than three months before they went missing, they moved from San Clemente, California to the upscale San Diego suburb of Fallbrook. What happened to the McStay family on February 4th, 2010? Early that morning, Summer chatted with her sister and made plans for a visit. Joseph left around noon for a meeting with his business partner, Chase Merritt. On November 19th, 2013, Chase did an interview with the Daily Mail. And here's what he had to say about that day. I was the last person Joseph saw. He came to Rancho Cucamonga on February 4th to talk to me about a huge business deal we had going on in Saudi Arabia. We met for an hour and a half lunch. He was so excited. We had the Saudi Arabian project and a few other things going on. The business had never been so good and we were looking forward to the future. He did nothing to suggest there was anything wrong or untoward. We both left and went home, and I spoke to him on the phone about two or three times on his drive back to Fallbrook. All standard business stuff. The last time I spoke to him was around 6 o'clock. At 4.25 p.m., someone called Joseph's cell phone from the McStay house. That was the last call made from the house. Between 5 o'clock and 5.47, text messages were exchanged between Joseph and Summer's cell phones. A neighbor's security camera captured what they thought might be the bottom of the family's Isuzu Trooper driving away from the house. But the camera was positioned to pick up activity in and around the neighbor's yard, so it didn't catch an image of anyone in the car. At almost 8.30 that night, a call from Joseph's phone was made to Chase Merritt. In the same interview with the Daily Mail, Chase said, I was watching a movie with my girlfriend, looked at the phone, and decided not to answer. Records show that call was made from the Fallbrook area. After that, there was no more activity from the family's devices. Four days went by, and no one could get in contact with Joseph or Summer. 
Then, on February 8, 2010, the family's white Isuzu trooper was towed from outside a strip mall one hour from the Mexican border. Security guards told investigators they thought it parked sometime between 5.30 and 7 o'clock on the same night it was towed. Surveillance footage caught a family of four walking through the San Isidro pedestrian gate between the U.S. and Mexico on February 8th. The picture is a grainy, almost indecipherable image of two adults and two children, roughly the same size as Joey Jr. and Gianni. On February 10th, Joseph's mother called the police and asked them to do a welfare check at the family's house. They drove by, saw no obvious signs of problems, and left. Chase Merritt told the Daily Mail he's the one who insisted she call the police. He said he went to the McStay house on February 8th to check on his business partner and found the place empty and their two dogs out in the backyard. By February 11th, when he still hadn't spoken to Joseph, Chase asked Joseph's brother to meet him at the house. Later that day, Joseph's brother went into the house through an open window and let Chase in through the front door. They called the police to report the family missing. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. The first officer on the scene described a home that looked like it was undergoing some minor remodeling. Newspapers, paint, and rollers were on the floor, blue painter's tape was on some of the door frames and cabinets, and the smell of fresh paint was in the air. An open carton of eggs and coffee grounds were on the kitchen counter, and two kid-sized bowls of popcorn were on the couch. The only thing obviously missing seemed to be the cover to the futon. Later that day, Joseph's mother came back to clean the house, and his brother took Joseph's computer, hoping to try and track the family down through emails or search history. But there was still that surveillance footage showing a family of four walking into Mexico on February 8, 2010. Then they found searches for Spanish lessons in children's passports on the family's computer. With nothing else to go on, it all added up to this. For reasons unknown, the McStays abandoned their car, their house, and their successful business and walked into Mexico. But that didn't explain why. Why were there no withdrawals from their bank accounts? Why would they leave without telling anyone? Why was Joseph's inhaler still in the car? And why were Summer's prescription sunglasses left in the house? No one besides the police really believed the family in the surveillance image were, were, were the McStays. Joseph's mother and even Chase pointed out that the man in the video didn't walk like Joseph. And for another thing, they didn't believe they'd ever leave the two dogs alone. The investigation might have ended there if it wasn't for a little-known police procedure in San Diego County. If a person is missing for more than 10 days, the case automatically transfers to the homicide department. So on February 19th, three murder cops and a tech from CSI searched the house and car. But this time, the house looked a little different. Joseph's mom had cleaned up. Newspapers that used to cover the floors were now in the trash outside. The counters were cleaned, and the painting supplies were all thrown away. So with no visible signs of struggle, the team didn't test the walls or furniture or much of anything. Let me just take a step back here and, and say it again. By this time, it had been 15 days since the family disappeared, and several people, including Chase Merritt and Joseph's family, had been in and around the house cleaning it and removing potentially key pieces of evidence, which means that everyone in that group of friends and family now had a legitimate reason why their fingerprints and DNA might be found there. And if, for example, the house was a crime scene, the murderer had ample opportunity to clean it up and paint over any blood evidence that might have been there. A year later, the house was sold in foreclosure and completely remodeled. For almost four years, the police had little to no leads to go on. Whatever happened to the McStay family in February 2010 seemed like it would stay a mystery forever. Although, there were many theories about what might have happened. One theory was that Summer killed her family and herself. Chase was even writing a book about it. He claimed Joseph was worried she was poisoning him in the days before she disappeared. He even asked Joseph's father to endorse it. And that's when the family started to suspect their missing son's business partner. And they weren't the only ones. During the initial investigation into their disappearance, police were taking a hard look at Chase Merritt. Not only was he the first person to raise the alarm, but he was also the last person to admit to seeing Joseph on the day they went missing. And that's not all. 
Chase was an ex-con with a shady past. According to CBS News 8, a woman who knew him suggested that police look into him and anyone associated with him. His arrest record was full of burglary-related crimes going as far back as the 1970s and as recently as 2001 when he got jail time and 10 years of probation for grand theft after stealing from an employer at an ironworks company. He was a frequent gambler, but apparently not a good one. And to top it all off, Chase was one of Joseph's business partners. And you know what that means. A close connection to a potential victim automatically means you need to be ruled out. And he thought he was. In the weeks after the McStays disappeared, Chase took a polygraph and he told everybody he passed it. In actuality, he sent up a couple of red flags. For one thing, he referred to Joseph in the past tense, saying he was his best friend. All in all, the test was inconclusive, but with no proof that an actual crime had even been committed, they couldn't dig into it any deeper. They had no choice but to focus their investigation on someone else. Joseph's other business partner, Dan Cavanaugh. He designed the website and did search engine optimization. At first, he got a percentage of website sales, but when Joseph brought on Chase to build custom water fountains, he wanted a piece of those sales too. Investigators say Joseph eventually agreed to buy Dan out, and the final payment to that effect was supposed to be made around the time he disappeared. After they went missing, Dan worked with Chase and Joseph's brother and mother to keep the business afloat. But eventually, in 2011, Dan sold the business, a move Joseph's father thought was bizarre since he considered Dan to be nothing more than, quote, the website guy. Dan also has an arrest record for domestic violence, but he was cleared as an official suspect after claiming he was in Hawaii at the time the family vanished. On November 13th, 2013, everything changed. Just to warn you, this next part is hard to hear. A motorcyclist called 911 after finding Joey Jr.'s skull in the Mojave Desert near Victorville, California. His four-year-old brother's remains were in a shallow grave nearby. Joseph was wrapped in the missing futon cover. He shared a grave with his son. Summer was buried next to them. Her sweatpants and her underwear were tossed near her head. Investigators think she might have been There were drops of paint on the bra she was still wearing. The way they were formed suggested she was lying on her side when it dripped on her. A three-pound sledgehammer had been thrown in her grave. The family's shattered skull said it was the murder weapon. After almost four long years of wondering if the McStays had fled to South America, in the end, they were found a hundred miles away. But here's a fact that the police found very interesting. Their graves were only about 20 miles from the area where Chase Merritt grew up. On November 7, 2014, he was arrested. It was almost a year to the day they found the McStay family. He claimed he didn't do it, and here's why the police think he did. Three days before the family vanished, Joseph emailed him a demand for $42,000, what he owed for botching a job, and it wasn't the first time. On February 4, 2010, investigators said their business meeting was far from the celebratory lunch Chase said it was. In actuality, Joseph was putting him on notice for screwing up high-paying projects and stealing company funds to pay off its gambling debts. If he threatened to take it to the cops, Chase would have been in for some lengthy prison time since he was still on probation from his 2001 arrest. His cell phone was also telling a very different story. The day the family disappeared, there were 27 calls between the two men. Chase's phone also pinged near the house in Fallbrook that day. And two days later, on February 6, 2010, his phone was tracked to a tower in Victorville near the spot they found their bodies. The day after they went missing, he cut $21,000 worth of checks to himself from the McStay's QuickBooks account. They were backdated to February 4th, the last day anyone saw the family alive. On February 8th, four days after they went missing, he broke into the house and logged onto the family's computer around 2 a.m. Later that day, he tried to cover his tracks. He used Joseph's phone to call QuickBooks and try to transfer the account to a new email address. When he couldn't answer the security questions, he tried to cancel it completely. He also told police that he'd never driven their Isuzu Trooper, but he didn't count on the DNA he had left behind. 
When police swabbed his cheek, they weren't checking his Ancestry.com results. They were looking for DNA, which they found on the steering wheel, the shift, the radio, and the AC control panel. Remember that neighbor's surveillance footage showing what they thought was the bottom of the Isuzu pulling out? In court, a prosecution witness used 3D animation to prove that the vehicle was actually Chase's truck. According to the prosecution, here's how all the admittedly circumstantial evidence adds up. Chase went to the house sometime before 7 o'clock on the night of February 4th, 2010. The kids were watching TV and eating popcorn. Summer was painting. Joseph might have been upstairs in his office on his computer. He used the sledgehammer to break Joseph's leg and make it harder for him to protect his family. The sledgehammer might have been in the yard or in the garage as part of the remodeling the family was planning on doing. Then he put an extension cord around his neck and tied him up. From there, what he might have done to Summer and the kids is like a nightmare. Maybe he got password access to Joseph's QuickBooks account that way. In the end, the entire family was killed. Chase drove away a little before 8 p.m. Two days later, he buried the bodies and abandoned the car near the border. Did he take a car service back into town? Did someone else give him a ride? That question of a second murderer or an accomplice of some kind is hard to ignore. The defense brought it up at trial and pointed to the other business partner as a more likely suspect. They pointed out that he was the man who ultimately sold the company, and he was the guy with the violent arrests on his record. They conceded that he was in Hawaii, but they suggested that he was a man with the computer skills to allegedly make it appear that he was out of town, when actually he'd already returned to California. And there's one more thing that suggested this was a two-person job in the words of the defense. The family was buried in two shallow graves. The defense claimed one killer would dig one hole, not two. And taking down a family of four would take two people. It makes some logical sense, but personally, I'm not so sure. Would Summer or the kids really try to attack Chase if he was threatening them with Joseph's safety? And if he was tied up, it would be a simple thing to attack Summer. The kids were too small to be a threat. We also have to remember that Chase would have had plenty of time. By his own admission, he was the one that called attention to the fact that they were gone. And he didn't insist on a welfare check until February 10th. That gave him six days to clean up the crime scene at the house and paint over any evidence left on the walls. Actually, more than that because the cops didn't actually come into the house until later that week. That's the theory the jury believed. They found him guilty and gave him the death sentence. But what do you think about the defense's second killer theory? Do you agree that Chase alone murdered the McStay family? I want to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Quick story. My coping mechanism used to be summed up in two words, potato chips. But with BetterHelp, I connected with a counselor that helped me figure out um, healthier ways to deal. And I thought counseling was something I didn't have time for, and I couldn't afford it anyway. But BetterHelp changed my mind. They offer licensed professional counselors who specialize in things like depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, trauma, much more. And it's all online, secure and confidential. You cannot beat the convenience, and it's actually affordable. They even offer financial aid. Honestly, it's more important than ever to take care of your mental health. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash recaps. No matter what you're going through, I have a feeling that they can help. Try BetterHelp. That's H-E-L-P dot com slash recaps. Now, back to our story. Okay, so I did a little research on this case, and you know how Google, like, fill, autofills when you're typing something? Well, when the immediate, the first thing that it started to autofill when I was typing in the McStay family is what happened to the McStay family dogs, which on the oh, one hand, yeah. like, yes, I totally wanted to know that. So, of course, I, like, looked, I read it. And here's what happened. So, the dogs were named Bear and Digger. Bear was um, oh. a Rottweiler and Digger was smaller. And <laughs> okay. probably dug a lot. I don't know. And they yeah, were left out in the backyard. But here's the deal. Okay. I don't know where to start with the dogs. I'm so excited about yeah, I knowing know about the dogs. The dogs. Mm -hmm. So, it 
the family, that was a huge red flag for the family, apparently, because they, again, like you said, they would never leave the dogs, but it went like kind of even beyond that. Apparently, when Summer was pregnant um, with one of the boys, she was looking up like spirit guides or, or some kind of pain management or birth management, something. Hmm. And she found this website where it was like, you have to pick sort of like a guardian angel that's in your life. And forgive me if I'm like getting this all messed up, but this this is what I'm remembering from it. So she picked Bear, their okay. dog, and as like her her guardian angel guide sort of thing. Yeah. And so it was important to have him with her all the time. Right. And they used to take that dog everywhere. And so the idea. So of you course, wouldn't leave your guardian angel behind sure. if you were going to run off to South America. No, but they were fine. They were. I don't want to say fine. I'm sure they were totally traumatized when they found him in the backyard, but they weren't, they weren't harmed. Right. You know, they were okay. And so they, they're, the family took them home. So they're, they're okay, which thank God. I'm like, I can't take the whole freaking family so no being dogs murdered were, and the dogs. Like it's yeah. a, too much, but that yeah, is a good thing. So, I'm really glad to hear that. I'm glad you brought that up because that, that did cross my mind a couple of times in this story is like, because it, it gets mentioned like twice, you know, yeah. the dogs, oh, the dogs are I left know. behind. So, I mean, it's so terrible, but you can see why I'm sure, obviously, they were probably really protective of the family. So there's no question that Chase would have like locked them outside, you know, put them in the backyard, shut the door, and then did, you know, everything that he did, which is just so freaking brutal. And it's awful. I mean, how do you do that to a three? I mean, obviously, how do you do that to anybody? But like, how do you the, the children, were, the whole family, I mean, over these business dealings, oh, so which which just seem like you know, but it's it's so strange because when you start to dig into the story at first, you're thinking, oh, they they do like water features. That's their business, yeah. you know, like fountains and really kind of nice, peaceful things. Oh my gosh! Like, like, okay, la wait, la landscaping I don't want to interrupt you. Wait, wait, wait! I just have <laughs> okay. to tell you this because I'm so glad that you brought that up because when I was reading about it too, I'm like, this is very unwater feature like behavior. That's right. Like, what do you? Why is this so aggressive? Yeah, yeah. That's that's what Scared. I, that's kind of what I'm thinking too. You know, it's like these, you know, waterfalls and, and nice running streams and things like that that you see in, yeah. in people's backyards that have been like, really done up. I mean, the business model, I'm like, wow, that, that's really cool. And then you, you hear about the partners and, you know, they're talking about the, the deal they have in Saudi Arabia. And it sounds like, wow, this is all on the up and up. And then it's just weird how you find out, oh, this guy's got this awful past, you know, yes. like what, how did you get from there to here? And, you know, and, know. and, and then this other guy, Dan, you know, he's got, you know, he's got a past too. And mm -hmm. it's just strange, you know? And so, so it just, be, yeah, I mean, it just, it just feels really, I wasn't expecting that, you know, like, like mm -hmm. they're, they're having all these dealings and stuff and over, over the idea that, okay, look, I need you to pay me this money. What is it, $42,000? Because you screwed up this thing, this mm -hmm. job, and now you need to make good on it, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 that their whole conversation, the last conversation they had, according to Chase, was, you know, so great. But really, it comes out that he was, he was kind of being lit up over mm -hmm. doing this before, you know, screwing up these jobs and stuff like that. And... Um, over that, yeah, to to come to that sort of an extreme reaction, just I don't know, man. I don't get it. It's unbelievable. I, I, I hear these things. Yes. And I'm like, I can't believe that you go to those lengths for that. You know, I I don't know. It no, I know. Like a, it's never gets. It never gets old. Like it, right. it really is the it's really root of all evil. It's, it's a surprise. It mm -hmm. just surprises me. Yeah. And then, you know, to go through all the stuff of trying to get into the house, you know, going to the house, logging on to QuickBooks, doing all those yeah. things and writing yourself the checks. Man, it's a, it's, it's pretty dark. I, I, I feel like that the, the jury was probably correct in assuming that it was Chase. You Just know? him? Like you don't think anybody else? Well, that's a good question. You know, um, I guess in my mind, I'm thinking it's, it's all Chase. I don't know. I mean, I do sort of. I, I, you know, part of me kind of agrees with the idea that it might be a, 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 a difficult task for one person to try to pull off, you know, like maybe, maybe one person could pull it off, but I kind of feel like if you were planning it and you're looking at the situation, you know, you might say, I better bring somebody else. So that's the only reason I think that maybe I, I'm not, I think one person could do it, but I think that you would 
think ahead of time, I need to bring someone else. And that's why two people would have been there. Yeah. Okay. No, that's you. That's you are. It's your opinion is valid. <laughs> but I have like, I, I don't know. I see it a different way. I see it more like, like kind of the way that you put it out there originally that, that Chase probably came to the house. He was upset. He wanted to keep talking to Joseph and maybe they were upstairs in like his office or something and he okay. freaked out and like started threatening him and then hit him but then like okay so when did he get the sledgehammer did he come into the house go out in the yard with the dogs maybe the sledgehammer was out there because you know they were doing a little bit of remodeling on the house right right he could pick that up be- he so, could have he could have gone into the office and had a little bit of a confrontation and then just said, "All right, well, I'm I'm leaving then." And then you know who knows? Maybe it occurred to him. Maybe he saw the sledgehammer. And said, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. And he went upstairs, mm-hmm. disabled him basically. Mm-hmm. Then he had him hostage, kind of in front of the family. And as 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 I said, you know, would would anybody really try to challenge that at that moment? You know, could, I don't think so. I mean. The, you know, and, and again, the kids weren't going to do anything. The only person who could have done it was Summer, and maybe she thought. But if you're worried for your ki- for your kids and your husband, yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't. Clearly, my life is in danger. She I better be forced <laughs> to like make that decision. Chris doesn't negotiate with terrorists. With terrorists, no, I just don't think that. Uh, uh, no, no, I don't think she would have made any kind of. I think possibly her position would have been. Let's let's see this to the end so we can all get out of here safely. Well, yeah. You know what I mean? And that didn't But of happen. course, there's no getting out of something like that. That guy's going to jail. If you if you walk away from By that, the time you put yourself out there, the police, yeah. Yeah. which clearly, you know, he thought, "Oh, it's so horrible." It's just crazy. I mean, the whole family actually have a story, like I said earlier about the whole family like being murdered at the same time, which is just, I don't know, so brutal. Murder, yeah. But this is from Family. almost a hundred years ago, and it is still oh. unsolved. It's wow. it's really it's one of those head scratchers. So I'm going to get into it. I can't wait to hear it. It took a week for neighbors to realize that they hadn't seen anyone from the Gruber house since March 22nd, 1922. At first, no one in the nearby village really thought anything of it. The Grubers lived outside of town on a remote farm known as Hinterkaifeck, and the family wasn't known for their hospitality. But then their closest neighbor heard a very strange story and decided to investigate. Earlier that day, a mechanic had been at the Gruber farm to repair an engine, but even though he was expected, it looked like no one was home. There was no smoke from the chimney, the barn doors were locked, and the dog could be heard barking inside, but no one came to the door. It was out of the ordinary, but since the lock was broken on the tool shed, he was able to get in and start working on the broken equipment anyway. When he finished almost five hours later, it looked like the family had returned. The barn was open, the dog was tied up outside, but no one had come out to say anything to him. Now, that was very not normal. In fact, it was so not normal that the owner of the neighboring farm decided to investigate along with two of his sons. When they went into the barn, they found the man of the house, Andreas Gruber, his wife, Kazelia, their daughter, Victoria Gabriel, and her daughter, seven-year-old Kazelia, hacked to death. Victoria and her mother had also been strangled. All four of their bodies were stacked on top of each other and covered with hay. Inside the house, they found the body of Victoria's two-year-old son, Joseph. He'd been hacked to death in his crib. And in her room was the body of the unluckiest maid in the world, Maria Baumgartner. Her first day working for the Grubers had ended in her murder. She was covered with a sheet, and the baby was found with one of Victoria's dresses draped over his body. And the murder weapon was nowhere to be seen, but the wounds appeared to be from a farm tool called a mattock, something like a pickaxe. Police believed that the four people found in the barn were lured out one by one, starting with Victoria, then her mother, then her father, and then last, her daughter, Cazelia. Tests were done to prove that sounds from the barn, even screaming, couldn't be heard in the house, which would explain why the murderer was able to kill all of them so violently without anyone running for help. But what drew them out to the barn in the first place is a mystery. The entire household had been dead since March 31st. 
but the house hadn't been empty. Someone had made themselves at home. There were signs of cooking in the kitchen. The cows were fed and milked. The dog was alive and well. Now remember the mechanic had seen that for himself, that the dog had been in and out of the house and someone had locked and unlocked the barn. And the mailman remembered seeing smoke from the chimney and uncollected mail in the four days before the bodies had been found. To run additional tests for evidence, the victims' heads were removed and taken back to Munich with the police. It was back then they thought that the heads contained the most evidence. But they didn't reveal much in the way of clues, and then they got lost during World War II. The family was buried together on April 8, 1922. But at their funeral, someone wrote the words incest and judgment from above in the funeral programs, which could mean that they'd been murdered as punishment, or it could just have been a clue that their neighbors were kind of... At first, Munich police thought the motive for the murders must have been money, a robbery gone wrong, but large sums of money were found in the house, untouched. Then neighbors remembered seeing Victoria crying on the side of the road only a few days before the murders. She was saying she needed to run away. She told people the family was being watched by a man in an army coat. And that's not the only strange thing. Andreas said he'd found a Munich newspaper in the house that he didn't buy, and he'd seen footsteps in the snow coming toward the house from the woods, but none walking away. Six months before their deaths, a maid had quit because she thought the house was haunted. She reported hearing footsteps and voices in the attic. And three days before the murders, a set of house keys went missing and were never found. But long before those unexplainable occurrences, the Gruber family had been at the center of some very Jerry Springer-like drama. For starters, no one was quite sure who little Joseph's actual father was. Victoria was a widow. Her husband, Carl, had been killed in the military around the same time that their daughter, Cazilia, was born. Although, his body was never found. But only six months after Cazilia was born, a maid walked in on Andreas, raping his daughter, Victoria. And when she reported it, they were both charged with incest. Andreas was in prison for a year, and Victoria was behind bars for a month. Talk about punishing the victim. But because of that very public scandal, when Victoria gave birth to Joseph five years later, there was some disagreement over whether Joseph's father was Andreas or their neighbor Lorenz, like she claimed. Yeah, Lorenz, the man who found their bodies. If you asked him before the murders, he would have told you that Joseph was not his child. But Andreas and Victoria said he was. They were even attempting to sue him for child support, while at the same time, Lorenz was filing charges against them for incest and trying to stop paying child support. But at the murder scene, when he saw the bodies stacked in the barn, witnesses say he started unstacking them, saying he was looking for his son, Joseph. And after the murders, there are rumors that he was trying to get back the child support that he'd already paid. But even though that the police suspected him, he was never charged and he always insisted he was innocent. But he was only one of more than a hundred suspects to be questioned over the years. Dozens of theories claiming to solve the case have been floated, but none have ever been proven. From the beginning, police didn't have a lot of evidence to work with. When Lorenz and his sons found the bodies, they moved them, touched them, they changed the crime scene. There were people in and out of the house long before the police got there. And since robbery wasn't the motive, they weren't sure what direction to take. Why murder everyone in the household so brutally and then live there for the next few days? Or was the murderer already there, living in secret in the attic? So it wasn't until the house was torn down a year after the murders that the murder weapon was found. The blood-stained mattock had been hidden in a secret compartment under the floorboards in the attic. Over the years, some of the more promising suspects included two guys known as the Gump Brothers, Adolf and Anton. On their deathbed, their sister said they did it because Adolf was in a relationship with Victoria, but her father refused to let her marry. Adolf had already died by then, and police could never prove that he and Victoria were ever together, or that Anton had anything to do with it at all. A few former employees were also suspected for different reasons, either because they were familiar with the farm and the animals, and maybe they had a grudge against the family, or because they knew they had money and wanted to rob them. But again, remember, the money wasn't taken. 
And there's another very interesting theory I want to run by you, and it involves a serial killer from America, a German immigrant named Paul Mueller, otherwise known as the Train Man. In their book called The Man from the Train, The Solving of a Century-Old Serial Killer Mystery, authors Bill James and Rachel McCarthy James speculated that Paul might be connected to the murders of the Gruber House. Based on their research, they think he killed up to 100 people in towns across the United States in the mid-1900s. His targets were families in small towns with a barn where he could live and watch them in secret. His murder weapon was the blunt edge of an axe or something similar, and he always left it. He was known for stacking the bodies after the murders and leaving police scratching their heads because he never robbed his victims. So did he go back to his native Germany and pick up where he left off? The Gruber murder files were closed in 1955, but in 2007, a police academy in Germany examined the case again using modern technology. While they admitted they had minimal evidence to work with, they did agree on one name as the primary suspect, but they wouldn't say who it was, since the person is long since dead, but the family is still living in the area. They did say that without a doubt, the motive was personal and called it a crime of passion. So, whose name do you think they came up with? Thanks for letting us catch you up on these truly strange cases. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please subscribe and let us know what you think in the comments. Until next time. Take care.